Hey, I'm Danish and welcome to Guided Hacking. In this tutorial, we will look at some basic x86 instructions, which you will find in IDA Pro and you can use it to recreate C++ code from assembly. Even if you are working on 64-bit applications, you will still find these tutorials helpful. You must know the basics of C or C++. Even if you just know how to write a Hello World program, you will still be able to understand reversing because we will go through the basics of assembly. When you write some code in C++ and compile it with your favorite compiler, it is converted into machine code, which is binary, ones and zeros. Since it is very hard to read machine code and we usually won't have access to the source code, we convert the code to an understandable language, which is assembly. The conversion from machine code to assembly is done using a disassembler. This is where IDA Pro comes in. It is not only a disassembler, but it also comes with a decompiler, which can decompile the machine code or assembly to readable C++. Today's video was generously sponsored by Malcore.io. Malcore is an automated malware analysis platform, which allows you to analyze malware online using a sandbox. Head over to Malcore.io in your browser. After login, you can upload a binary file by clicking Smart Scan to start the analysis. In the scan report, we can check very easily if the file is malicious or not. Here the file entropy is 7.9, which means the file is packed. It also found common win 2 bi functions, which are used for malicious activities. We can view the file assembly, hex dump, exports and imports. It automatically generates Yara rules for the binary. You can hunt for IOCs either by IP address, Yara or domain. For more advanced scans, click as scans. You can find similar code in two binaries using code reuse option. Analyze MS Word or other documents using document file analysis. And check if a URL is malicious. With the pro features, you can even emulate shell code. Analyze PK files and analyze malicious scripts. You can try out Malcore for free by clicking the try scan at the top and create a free account. You can also upgrade your account for as low as $4.99, which will allow you to upload large files and unlock more scans and hunts per month. In computer programming, there's something called a memory stack. In my personal opinion, if you learn how memory stack works, then you have learned 50% of assembly. When you launch a program, the first thread is created by the operating system to execute the main function, hence the name, the main thread. The main thread has a memory stack, which is used for storing temporary information like function parameters, local variables, the return address of the function we called, and CPU registers. In fact, every thread of the application, whether if it's the main thread or not, will have its own stack within memory. The size of the memory stack depends on the compiler mostly. Normally, it is somewhere between one to two megabytes, which is more than enough. Hackers manipulate the memory stack of a thread when the thread is executing some specific assembly instruction in order to change the behavior of the program. There is some other temporary data pushed on the stack when we call a function and popped off when the function returns. To understand properly what this other temporary data is and how exactly it is pushed and popped from the stack, we first need to learn some assembly. Without further ado, let's jump straight into it. On a 32-bit program, we use four general purpose registers of the CPU, EX, EBX, ECX, and EDX. You can think of the CPU registers as temporary storage within the CPU, just like RAM, except CPU registers are super ultra fast when you compare them to RAM. Each of these CPU registers can hold only four bytes of data at a time, which is 32 bits, they are literally used throughout the code because in assembly, there are no variables like we find in C++. In assembly, the most commonly used instruction is the move instruction because it is used to move data into registers and memory. For example, if you wish to move the number 15 into EX register, then we write it as move EX 15. And if you want to move the data from one register to the other, let's say from ECX to EX, then we write it as move EX, ECX. For move instruction, the value from the right operand is moved into the left one. Let's see how we can use the move instruction to write a hell cheat. In the GT San Andreas games, when CG falls from a height, CG will lose some health. We need to disable that. Launch it engine, open the process. 
let's find our health memory address. The maximum value for Suji's health is 100. Let's look for floating point values between 50 and 90 or 85. Change the scan type to unchanged value and then move the player in the map and click next scan to filter out values that have nothing to do with the player's health. And now we will search for decreased values after falling again in the game. Keep repeating this process to filter out more values in Cheat Engine. Hopefully by the next scan we will find the correct health value, but for you it might take more time if you are doing it for the first time. At last, we found a value that might be our health. So when I changed it to 100, our health bar also changed. This confirms it's the right one. Now we need to find which instruction modifies CG health when CG falls on the ground. Once again, we have to go in the game and make the player fall to take some damage to find out which instruction rise to the health. And it seems that we found one instruction. This instruction modifies the health of the player. This is how the player class looks like within GD San Andreas game. There are other members within the C player class which come before the health member and these other members take a total space of 540 in hexadecimal. So the offset 540 is used to access and modify the health by the assembly instruction. These three assembly instructions are generated by the compiler from this code statement. The player health is decremented by the damage factor and the result is stored within the new health variable. But as we know, there are no variables in assembly. The compiler will instead use a CPU register. And here the ADX register is used to store the new health. And this instruction probably comes from a code statement like this. The value from the ADX register is moved into the health address of the player. Now we want to replace this instruction with a new one where we will set the value of the new health variable to 100 so our health always stays at 100. Since we are dealing with a floating point value, we must convert the value 100 to hexadecimal because floating points are basically hexadecimal values in assembly. And now we will replace the instruction. This will make sure that our health always stays at 100. If we try falling again, we will not lose any health. The move instruction is also used to read and write data from memory. To read data from memory, we need two things. A memory address to read from, a CPU register to store the data. If we assume the EX register contains the memory address and we wish to store the data in the ECX register, then we write it as move ECX square brackets EX. The square brackets instructs the assembler that the register EX contains the address and it needs to be dereferenced to get the value. This moves the 4 bytes from the memory address into ECX because the size of ECX register is 4 bytes. And similarly, to move some data into memory from a CPU register, move square brackets, the register with the address and the register with the data to move the data from. This will move the 4 bytes of data from ECX register into the memory address which is stored within EX. Now imagine if we have some C++ code where we define a boolean type local variable. The size of the local variable will be 1 byte in C++. If we set its local variable to true or false or do some other operation on it in C++, when we compile the code it is converted into machine code. And we know that in assembly there are no variables. So a CPU register will be used for this boolean type local variable. In such a case it's common for the compiler to use a 1 byte register. Let's take a look at this. This means we can use 1, 2 or complete 4 bytes of space within the general purpose register if you want. For data types where the size is 1 byte like boolean or char, then the compiler will use a 1 byte subregister from one of these 32-bit registers. 
Let's see if the compiler is going to use the EX register, then it will use the AL or AH sub register because their size is one byte. If the size of the data type is two bytes like short, then a two byte sub register will be used like AX from EX register. The two byte sub register AX is simply AL and AH combined, which gives us a total of two bytes. And finally for four bytes data types like int, the entire register is used. You might be wondering, how do we use these subregisters in assembly from EX when we are dealing with one or two bytes of data? Well, we just casually write their name. For example, if we are assuming here the EX register contains a memory address, so only one byte of data will be moved into the AL register from the memory address because the size of the AL subregister is one byte. Technically speaking, the CPU will access four bytes of data from memory instead of one byte if it is a 32-bit program. But since the size of the AL register is one byte, it will move the first byte from the memory address into the AL register and the remaining three bytes are discarded. And to read two bytes of data from a memory address, we simply use a two byte register like AX, BX, CX, or DX. Similarly, for reading and writing one byte of data, from or to memory, we use one of the one byte sub register. We can also write it in English to avoid making mistakes. This instruction will move the value five into the memory address stored within EBX. It will write only one byte of data into memory as we specify it by PTR. If we wish to move two bytes of data into memory, then we change it to word PTR. Word in programming is referred to two bytes of data. And for four bytes of data, we change it to D word PTR. D word in programming means double word, basically four bytes. It is completely up to us which general purpose register we use or how we wish to do it because we are in full control. Each of the general purpose register has a name. EEX. AX stands for accumulator. Return value of C++ functions is normally stored in EX register. EBX. BX stands for base. It doesn't have any specific use. It can be used for almost any general purpose. ECX, CX stands for counter. It is normally used in loops for counting. EDX, DX stands for data. Just like ABX, it doesn't have any specific use and it can be used for any general purpose. We will create a new project for adding some code in assembly. Choose the project type, then write the name of the project, and then we can create the project. And then we just have to add the C++ source file and write the assembly code. Let's say if you wish to process a transaction in C++, at assembly, it will look something like this. Visual Studio allows us to write inline ASM for the 2-bit programs in C++. Once again, we will call the getchar function at the top so the code does not immediately exit. Let's run the program and attach Visual Studio Debugger. In order to attach to the process, we need to look for the name of the process and then we can attach to it. And now we can place a breakpoint on the first assembly instruction. First, the value 130 is moved into the EX register and then the control goes to the second instruction and moves the value 50 into ECX. Then the compare instruction gets executed. Here the jump instruction means jump if lower and then the jump instruction is executed. In this case, the result of the condition is false. As EX, which represents our balance, is not lower than ECX, so the jump is not taken, and the control goes back to the process. Now, if the balance was less than the payment amount, then the control would have jumped to the cancel payment code. If we take a look at the unconditional jump, which is simply written as JMP in assembly, this jump is always taken no matter what because it doesn't check for any conditions. The final thing that we should know about the compare instruction, it is always written before the jump instruction. It takes two operands and it will subtract one operand from the other and set some CPU flags. Then the jump instruction will use these flags to decide whether to take the jump or not. We don't need to worry about these flags because the operating system will handle the jump for us, but it is good to know how things work. Here's a list of other conditional jumps. Each of these jump instructions will look for specific CPU flags. And if they are set, then the jump is taken. Otherwise, the next instruction, which comes after the jump, will be executed. 
These CPU flags will either contain the value 1 or 0. 1 means the flag is set, 0 is not set. Regarding flags, the most important thing that we must know about them is that some of these flags are used by the jump instruction to decide whether to take the jump or not. 